Okay, well, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening um, for our Get to Know the Friend series with Lana Robinson. I'm just going to start off by saying that this evening is going to be recorded. So if you don't want um, your face as part of the recording, be sure to turn off your video. And this is only for our archival purposes and also so that anyone who couldn't join us tonight um, can watch it in the future. So just a, a quick reminder, turn off your video if you don't want to be recorded. Um, so my name is Rachel Singleton Polster. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm very honored to be well. introducing oh. Lana tonight um, oh, for the Get to Know the Friend series. So first off, I just want to start by welcoming, uh, welcoming you all to uh, the Canadian Friends Service Committee. And some of you know very well that uh, main offices of CFSC are located at 60 Lowther in Toronto. And that is on the traditional territory of the Wendat, Petun, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And this land has been the site of human activity for over 1500 years and is the subject of the dish with one spoon wampum which is a sacred treaty between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek nations. Um, and I myself am joining you from way over on the west coast on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations in East Vancouver. Um, so we're going to start off before we pass it over to hear Lana's stories, we're going to start off with a few moments of silent worship, which if you're not familiar with, we just encourage you to settle into the, the silence um, and don't forget to keep yourself on mute. And then after about five minutes, I will bring us out of the silence. So now we'll settle into that. Thank you, friends.
Thank you, friends. So nice to be with you all and to see so many familiar, friendly faces. I'm going to pass it over to Kira now um, to share some housekeeping notes with us before we get started. Thanks, Rachel. Um, hi, everyone. So nice to see you all, and thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, I'm just going to ask that everyone keep themselves muted um, while Lana is speaking and also while Rachel is speaking. Um, and please unmute yourself during our discussion time if you would like to um, participate in that and speak during that, but only when you plan on speaking, just so we can avoid any uh, background noise. Um, that would be great. Uh, the chat is open and we will be having a discussion, like I said. I just ask that you keep that a safe and respectful place for all. Um, Rachel mentioned this earlier, but I'm just going to mention it again um, for the folks that have joined us since, but this evening is being recorded for the Quaker Archives and also for the, uh, the friends that are not able to join us tonight. Um, so if you do not want to be on the recording, please do turn off your video. Um, if you're having connectivity issues, I just recommend logging off and logging back on. That usually fixes it. And also just try turning off your video. That often helps. Um, and I'm just asking that you keep all discussion questions until the end. Um, you're free to put them in the chat, but we really hope that you'll feel comfortable enough to share them at the end during the discussion time. Um, at that point, please feel free to just unmute yourself and ask a question when there is an opening. And if you're having a hard time um, squeezing in there, uh, feel free to use the raise hand button using the reactions button um, at the bottom. But other than that, uh, thank you so much for coming and I'll pass it back to Rachel. Fabulous. So all of you, many of you probably know that CFSC is the Canadian Friends Service Committee, and we are the peace and social justice arm of Canadian Friends or Canadian Quakers. And this year, it's very exciting. We are celebrating um, CFSC's 90th anniversary. And so we're doing this series of Get to Know the Friend on the last Thursday of every month. Um, so we've got a I think one or two more coming up and Kira is going to post a link in the chat. So if you missed any of them um, in the previous months, please do check it out because there are some fabulous friends on there sharing stories about the history of CFSC and their own experiences. And tonight we're going to have some fabulous storytelling uh, by our very own Lana Robinson, who is the clerk right now of CFSC. Um, now, I've known Lana, I've had the privilege of knowing Lana for, I think, over half of my life, um, and that makes up, uh, I think, most of her journey with friends as well. Um, I was uh, very fortunate to have Lana in my uh, worship group in the Couchin Valley uh, when I was growing up, and I was even a babysitter as a teenager to one of her children, um, so that was very fabulous, knowing her in that personal way. Um, and then we also sort of shared a journey together. We were both sort of interns or program assistants. Um, we were both playing a role at Quaker service organizations at the same time. Um, I was in Toronto and Lana was in Geneva. So, you know, it's a real, a real honor, Lana, to be here with you tonight and to introduce you. So I'm, I'm just thrilled to introduce such a compassionate and warm person to our series tonight. Um, so if that didn't make you cry, Lana, I'm going to pass it right over to you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for those very kind words. Um, and you did not make me cry. I have uh, Jen Preston sitting on my shoulder right now, um, reminding me not to cry. Um, so we'll get to that part later. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. It is so wonderful to see so many of you uh, that I haven't seen in a very long time. Um, and just so you know, I'm not reading the chat, but I did see a couple of you have to excuse yourselves at some point uh, before we're done. And just know that I see you here and I'm thrilled that you could make it for as long as you're able to stay. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I am uh, coming to you uh, from the Cowichan, um, unceded and traditional territory of the Cowichan and Coast Salish people. And I'm going to ask Kira at this point to put up that first slide um, because it uh, shows um, 
the very beautiful setting that um, friends in the Cowichan Valley uh, call their Sunday meeting home, although we're in a building behind this large building. And um, uh, we worship here um, almost every week. I think we're moving to every week. It's been every two weeks. And I've been a happy part of that family for a long time now. Half of Rachel's life, apparently. So uh, in terms of storytelling, um, I'm gonna share with you tonight kind of two stories that um, intersect and eventually merge. And ones that um, it's been a very interesting journey to reflect upon as I was preparing um, for this evening. And um, one of them uh, I came to look at as the things I do and have done uh, in, in the world. And I saw the other part of that story or a different story um, as the person I am and the person I wish to become. So um, I think both of those stories sort of had their very beginnings in my childhood. Uh, my parents, I grew up here on the island. I have one brother. Um, my father has passed away a number of years ago. My mom lives in Prince Rupert, but I am an island girl. My parents provided me with a really rich childhood. Uh, they were avid canoeists and scuba divers and campers and hunters and beekeepers. Um, so I had a lot of different experiences growing up. Uh, my dad was a, a union activist um, with the longshoremen and a conservationist. So perhaps some things I come by very naturally in terms of uh, seeking justice and speaking out. Um, at about 10 years old, I can remember being part of my school's litter patrol, um, complete with a litter bug sticker on my jacket. And at about 14 years old, I managed to get myself suspended from school for staging a student walkout and march to City Hall to support the Canadian Union of Public Employees who were on strike at that time. So clearly my father uh, and mother made an impression on me and started me off on that road. Um, on a spiritual journey, my mom was raised in the Catholic tradition and that's where I sort of uh, grew up in my early years going to church, going to mass, um, catechism classes. Uh, I remember really loving the stories of Jesus' life in the New Testament and the way he was in the world. However, uh, early on, I began to question the teachings of the church as, as I was getting them. And uh, by about the time I was 14 and getting myself suspended from school, I declared myself to be an agnostic. So that sort of put a, a hold on that journey for a while, or at least changed it in meaningful ways. So in terms of service work and how I came to be where I am, I feel as though that story has a very specific beginning. And it began on a bus ride as so many interesting stories often do. Um, I was living in Calgary and I was probably 30 something years old and I had taken a bus ride to Golden BC to go visit my brother. And during that visit, I'd done a little shopping, uh, cooked some meals, had a nice time, got back on the bus to head home. And on that bus ride home, I was looking at this lovely, Guatemalan backstrap woven wallet that I had purchased. And it got me to wondering about how much of the $7.25 plus tax plus tax that I had spent on that wallet actually made it into the hands of the person who created it. And knowing what I did about um, consumerism and the retail market, I started thinking about, well, when the retailer took their piece and the wholesaler took their piece and the importer took their piece and perhaps somebody else in between the artisan and the wholesaler uh, took their piece and all the shipping and handling got paid for, the artisan probably received a very little for their hard work. And I don't know if you know anything about backstrap weaving, but it's, um, time consuming and an incredible process. So I thought about that. And by the time I'd gotten back home on that long bus ride, I decided that I, 
I needed to explore a way to change the way people uh, where I live um, and myself uh, could make choices about the things that they bought, about the gifts they purchased, about the clothes they wore, and how, um, how they voted with their dollars, so to speak. So I, uh, I got home and I wrote letters to Anita Roddick from the body shop asking about her fair trade practices. I wrote letters to uh, the Fair Trade Federation asking for organizations that were doing that work. I uh, received some letters back, which inspired me. I wrote to an organization at that time called Community Concerns because I had read that that's where Ben and Jerry's were sourcing their um, nuts for their ice cream from, and I thought that was a good idea. So I got some of that information and then I went to my local economic development board and I said, hey, this is what I wanna do. I wanna give people the opportunity to do something different when they buy things, um, to be part of something bigger, to contribute in a more meaningful way to the lives of others. And seriously, they laughed me out of the office. They told me to my face that I was never going to be able to convince people to pay a premium price for products uh, just by telling them that they were ethically sourced or sustainably sourced. And so I did what any rational thinking person would do. And Kira, you can throw up that next slide. I went ahead and did it anyways. So um, about 1993, I think it was, I opened a fair trade store in Little Wembley, Alberta. My husband at the time refitted uh, a building in our backyard and I opened my doors. I had a lot of support from the folks at uh, what was called Self-Help Crafts of the World at the time. It is now called 10,000 Villages um, by the Mennonite Central Committee. They were super supportive. And I met another uh, bunch of fair traders through different organizations. And they were also very supportive. This really was a different way of doing business. And so I got to go to work every day and tell people stories. I got to connect people with the things they were buying. And I did okay. Um, my motivation wasn't profit, it was choice. And so um, that shop grew from my backyard uh, into a shop in uh, Grand Prairie where I, um, I expanded and moved myself uptown and uh, carried on. So at that time, um, the local, a uh, couple of the women who came into the store were also members of the local Little United Church in Wembley. And as members of the United Church, they were also members of the local Kairos uh, committee. And they were just getting started. And at that time, Kairos was, um, advocating for uh, fair trade coffee and fair trade clothing. There were, there were a couple of campaigns and I can't remember which one came in at the time, but they, the local Kairos group was hosting a regional gathering and they called me in as the resident fair trade expert in the community and asked if I would help out. So uh, I volunteered to do that and um, went to the regional gathering there and met some nice folks and to my shock was recruited to sit upon the Kairos, um, at that time it was called 10 Days for Global Justice, on their national board. The regional rep who was at the meeting was having to step aside and they said, hey, maybe you could do this. And I said, hey, I don't really even know what ecumenical means, but they said, that's okay. You don't need to worry about the church part. You can be the regional person. So I took on the role and um, actually, Truth be told, at that time, I had to look up what the word ecumenical meant. I did not have any church background, and so this was all new for me. However, um, I went off and joined um, the Kairos National Board and um, sat on that board for probably four or five years. Um, I really enjoyed the work for the first time, it felt like there was something coming closer to a connection between what I was doing and where I felt my spirit wanted to live. 
um, Kairos and the work of Kairos at that time uh, felt like a, a real um, expression of what I believed about being in the world and my responsibilities. So um, to revert to the other part of the story and the spiritual journey of which that was a part, between that time, I had been exploring things. I had checked out evangelical Christianity with the Pentecostal Assemblies of God, because that's where my husband's background was. I had uh, looked at the United Church and sort of liberal uh, Christianity. I had been involved in Taoism through uh, the local temple. I had looked at Hinduism and was looking at New Age spirituality. None of those places felt like home. Um, but Kairos at that time did. It felt more like home than anything else I'd been involved with. So um, at that time in Grand Prairie, I dug in with Kairos um, at the local level. And go ahead, Kira, I think there's another slide there. I'm trying to remember what's there. Yes. Uh, so it was, it was a really busy time. I, I was inspired in a lot of ways and um, helped them organize a lot of events. We did um, things like um, a protest march, peace march, when uh, the talk was about invading Iraq came up. Um, we did poverty workshops. We um, held discussion groups at the local college. Um, we actually even performed social justice plays at a local fringe festival. Uh, and that was great. I still have the video proof of that. My children laugh outrageously, but it was a good time. Um, and so that was a very busy and fulfilling time in my life. My kids were young um, and my business was going um, and I had all this work with Kairos that sort of fed my soul. Um, so about 1990, let me think now, nope. 2003, um, I was afforded the opportunity to go with um, the Kairos delegation to the World Social Forum in Brazil. Um, and that's what some of these newspaper articles about the community paper interviewed me, and that was great. Um, the, the trip to Brazil was, um, oh, Oh no, see, this is the thing about storytelling. I remembered something else. So back, back working with Kairos, where it intersects with Quakers is at a Kairos gathering in Sylvan Lake, I had the, the incredible gift of meeting Kitty Dunn. Kitty Dunn attended, it was a Kairos gathering. And I recall thinking that this was the most quietly influential person I had ever met. Sitting there talking with Kitty, she just had this strength uh, to her words. There weren't a lot of them, um, but there was this strength there. And I remember feeling like, wow, where does that come from? Kitty was forever in my mind uh, as someone um, who, who spoke to things the way I wanted to be able to speak to them with this quiet, solid confidence in what she was saying. So um, here we are back in uh, Brazil where I had the interesting uh, fortune uh, to meet and chat with Jane Orion. Jane Orion Smith was on that delegation to Brazil as well. Now, I know Jane Orion would tell the story differently, um, Jane Ryan, this is my story tonight, so I'm going to tell it. I recall very clearly standing in a hallway with Jane Ryan uh, in the hotel that they had put us up in, having a conversation about life and love and perspective. And she says to me at one point, she says, Hannah, you sound like you could be a Quaker. You should come to Western Half Yearly Meeting. And I thought to myself, okay. And when I got home, I made arrangements to do just that. Uh, three months later, I found myself at a Western Half Yearly Meeting, which is held in Sorrento. Um, and uh, I know that some folks would say uh, that attending Western Half Yearly Meeting 
uh, can feel a little bit for first time attenders like attending someone else's family reunion. It's a very affectionate place. Uh, there's a lot of hugging that goes on. Of course, I understand much better now, but at that time, um, it actually didn't feel like someone else's family reunion. It felt like I had found a family. I spent the most incredible three days meeting people, talking with people. I sat in on business meeting and was seriously moved by the way it all went. Um, so it, it really, it really touched me in a lot of different ways. Um, so, but at the time I was still living in Grand Prairie and there were no Quakers in Grand Prairie. So um, I had to satisfy myself with continuing with the Kairos work that I was doing. Um, I did manage to uh, help with a few more events. I took myself to Quebec City to the FTAA protest and witnessed what a really big and gathered social movement felt like. Um, it was quite, quite the thing. Um, but about a year after that, I moved to the island here and came to the Cowichan Valley. Um, and I got connected with both the local Kairos group and the local friends meeting, uh, which was at that time, the Duncan Worship Group, which um, was meeting at Providence Farm and um, was under the care of the Victoria Friends Meeting. Um, I continued to work with the Kairos group uh, and as well as continued to attend the Duncan Worship Group meetings and eventually uh, came to apply for membership. And one of the, the things I recall most about my application for membership was Genevieve Singleton being on my clearness committee and looking at me at one moment and saying, I know the work of the Canadian Friends Service Committee interests you, but what will you contribute to your local meeting? And it was a good question and one that I really had to consider and took seriously. Um, and I did contribute to my local meeting um, through a number of roles. But most importantly, I felt like even asking me that question and allowing me to consider it and reflect on it, I really felt for the first time that I had found a spiritual home, that coming to friends was like finding that place that I'd been looking for all those years. So um, here I am in the Couch and Valley. So about that time, uh, when I joined the Friends Meeting here, I also attended an alternative to violence program training workshop in Argenta, which was lovely and an amazing experience. And at that workshop, I met Mark Forge and Shauna Curry. And Mark was uh, one of the facilitators and Shauna worked with him. And I was so inspired, uh, not just by the workshop itself, which was amazing, but by the work that they were doing, this sort of community facilitation. And I thought to myself at one point, man, I would love to do that kind of work to get up every morning and be able to meet with people and help people learn about how to do things differently in the world. So I decided that I could go back to school at 40 something years old to go to university and get my undergraduate degree. And maybe that would formalize a lot of the learning that I'd already had um, in doing the community service work, uh, the kind of stuff I'd been volunteering for. I thought, okay, well, maybe instead of volunteering for that kind of work, I could turn it into my vocation with a little education and that magic piece of paper that says, yes, you are qualified to do these things. So to university I went and uh, 
discovered that I am indeed a political animal and enjoyed my political science and anthropology and global studies classes. And in my fourth year, um, thought that I would like to do an internship. And the internships on offer um, at the university were not the ones I really wanted to do. What I wanted to do was work with Quakers. And so Jennifer Preston happened to be in Duncan talking about her work and knowing that she was involved with the service committee, I asked her what the potential for doing an internship uh, with friends was. And Jennifer Preston, whom I owe a huge debt of gratitude to, hooked me up with Tasman Rajat, who was the staff person at the Quaker International Affairs Program at the time, uh, situated in Ottawa. And Tasman and I talked about what that potential might be. And Tasman worked with my um, political science prof and we figured out a plan for me to be able to do an internship with um, QUIAP in Ottawa and uh, the friends in Geneva at CUNO, the United Nations office. And this was, this was, uh, it, it was such an amazing thing. I knew that I would have to finance it myself and I did uh, happily. Tasman hooked me up uh, with the CUNO office. I had to find a place to live, which I did uh, just outside of Geneva. And off I went to Switzerland. The work at Friends House um, was amazing. Um, one of the highlights for me was actually rummaging around in the attic at Friends House in Geneva, where they kept all these boxes of um, handwritten notes about meetings that had taken place as far back as the 50s and 60s. And there were, there were handwritten notes in there from gatherings of people that had been gathered in those quiet circles, the way Quakers work internationally by bringing people together um, off the record. Uh, it was incredible to read that history of friends work internationally. Um, and uh, I spent, I think, seven weeks in Geneva. Oh, I think there's the next slide there. Kira? Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. No, we're not there. Hmm. Um, okay, we'll go to the next slide anyways. I was fortunate enough to work with Habitat during my time in Grand Prairie. And um, we'll just leave it there for now. That was such a fun thing. Anyways. So I went to Geneva. I spent time in Ottawa where I met the amazing Carol Dixon, um, who sort of introduced me further to the ways that Quakers work. We worked on a project around the commons, which I found fascinating and has since uh, colored my way of looking at the way we share resources. Um, I was able to go to Canadian Yearly Meeting for the very first time. I met many of you there um, and felt like I had deepened my sense of belonging uh, to the Quaker community. Um, okay, so you can go to the next slide now, Kara. Yes, thank you. So after I graduated, um, it was about 2011 or 2012 that Orion contacted me uh, about service on CFSC. And she had asked if I would be interested in serving on the Indigenous Rights Committee. And yes, I would. And I'm gonna explain this slide to you. Um, this was, uh, this is a stained glass window that is in the Anglican Cathedral um, in Prince Rupert, which is where the um, diocesan head is, the Diocese of Caledonia, I think it is. Um, and this was a reconciliation window that they raised funds for uh, to put in that Anglican church. The designs uh, were done by a Haida woman and the windows 
were built by myself in my studio in Shawnigan Lake. And I took a lot of pleasure and humility and pride in being afforded the opportunity to build these windows. Um, and it was about that time, or just before the time I was able to come on to CFSC and work in the Indigenous rights work with uh, Jennifer as the staff person. I think Rachel might have actually been on that committee as well, and Rob Hughes. Um, it was a real treat to uh, be welcomed onto CFSC in that way. And um, I soon sort of made myself right at home at Friends House in Toronto and took on um, the role of recording clerk as well. And that was also a real gift, uh, which harkened back to my time at Victoria Friends Meeting where I was recording clerk there. So these things, you know, the local work and the work with CFSC were mutually supportive of one another. Um, during my first year at CFSC, I applied for and was given a grant. Uh, so don't ever forget that CFSC has got uh, grant funding available for people to uh, explore Quaker work in different ways. And I applied for a grant to attend the World Gathering of Friends in Kenya in 2012. And that would be the next slide, Kira. I hope. Nope, that's the UN. Oh, darn. That's the UN too. There's Kenya. Um, there we are. That's the Canadian contingent. And I recognize many of those faces. Uh, and it was a it was a a trip that I had wanted to go to. One of the things about friends that I was coming to look at and be challenged by in ways was when I talked about the community, there's this broad spectrum of Quakers. And when you start to tell that story of who's a Quaker, or what is a Quaker, um, people say, well, these are all very different kinds of things. How can you all be Quakers? I said, well, there's something that brings us all together as a family. And what I found at attending this gallery was what I believed to be the essence of what it was that held us all together. And um, I'm deeply grateful for that experience to sit with that uh, in sometimes discomfort, but to be able to sit with that with others was a real gift. Mm. So that was the first year at CFSC, and that was a real opportunity that um, I was able to enjoy. And I've drawn upon that opportunity uh, many times since. Um, back on CFSC, I was tenderly tutored by uh, Leslie Robertson uh, into the role of clerk. It was a real treat to learn from her um, whatever clerking skills I have, I, I credit her and the other amazing clerks I've been able to work with over the years. And um, I also had the opportunity at CFSC to be the personnel clerk. And I can tell you that that is a rewarding and humbling experience in that uh, finding a way to support the incredible staff that CFSC has has been a joy uh, over the years that I've been on CFSC and the years I spent as the CFSC personnel clerk. Um, I am still amazed um, by the work that the staff does. Uh, we have a small staff and the work that they accomplish speaks uh, somewhat to their skill and more to their dedication and commitment uh, to the work and the organization. So that has been one of the real gifts of my time with CFSC. It's been about 10 years of service on the committee and it's been a deep privilege. I've been able to um, participate in and um, be a part of some big pieces of internal work that CFSC has done over the years. The restructuring was a big thing and our first ever strategic plan 
Um, and Pete Cross can certainly speak to how long those conversations uh, had been going on before we were ever actually able to bring something forward um, that has since become a guiding and living document uh, that we work with all the time and helps guide our work. Uh, and that's, that was a real process for me too. I'd never really been involved in that kind of uh, work. Um, and recently, as friends will know, I was blessed uh, with the opportunity to travel um, with the Kairos delegation. And please let this be the next slide, Kira. I'm so bad at this. Yes, no, that's Africa. Oh yes, in Kenya, 800 people attended that world gathering. And it was one of those things, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions about what that was all like um, afterward, but sitting in the, the meeting for worship with all of these friends, um, was incredible. It was an incredible gift to be with such a wide variety of friends from around the world. I think there were 51 countries there. Okay, um, are we on to, yes. So last, no, 2019, um, I was able to be part of a faith leaders um, delegation that was sponsored or sort of organized by Kairos to Palestine, Israel. And um, that journey, uh, I have to say, uh, has changed me uh, in many ways or has at least taken residence in my heart. The people and the places that I was able to see and the people I met both from the ecumenical um, group that was gathered there um, and the people in Palestine and Israel that we, we met with and worked with. Um, this is outside the friend's house in Ramallah, where I was uh, fortunate and touched and overwhelmed to meet uh, Jean Zaru, and that is the next slide. Um, she was the most remarkable woman to speak with. Um, I can't even imagine how long she's been clerk of that meeting. It's been a very long time. Uh, and she spoke with that same simple, strong conviction that I heard Kitty Dunn speak with all those years ago and with such great love, um, even talking about the most painful or the most mundane things, it's present in her. And so that was a real, a real privilege for me. Um, one of the other people that I was able to meet on that trip was Amos Gewertz. And that's on the next slide. And he, um, we visited him at a kibbutz and he spoke with such simplicity um, to the struggles of the people there. And uh, it was a real privilege to hear him speak as well. I don't, I don't know how I'm going to be able to continue to share the gift that that journey uh, gave me um, COVID sort of put an immediate damper on any kind of large gatherings, um, but I am trying to work with uh, others involved in the Israel-Palestine Working Group uh, here locally to attend events, and Linda Tafts, I can thank you for that, and uh, Maxine for being an inspiration in that work as well. All of those things. Um, and here we are. I... Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity that I was given to reflect on my time with the service committee and the journey uh, to, to service committee and to friends and the, the work that I've done or the things I've done over time. And that was one of the big gifts of this whole evening for me. So um, pardon my self-indulgence here. Um, I, through looking at all of these things and trying to organize my thoughts, which I only did half well, um, I realized that I did not come to service work through friends. Uh, I came to friends through service work. And if there was ever anything to be said about, you know, the reason we don't knock on doors, that, you know, we have this sense that people will will find friends, they'll find us. 
Uh, they'll be led. Spirit will lead them to us. And I feel like my story is definitely that. Um, and in reflecting on the things I've done in the world, the events we've done and things like that, those things that address the need I felt to do them uh, have become or perhaps have always been more than the things I've done. They are a manifestation of who I am and have always been in my core. Up until the time I found friends, I never felt quite like my spiritual life was fully fed. Um, Cairo sort of did that for a number of years and thinking about it, it was a community of faiths that I could participate in. But for me, Quakers and the work of CFSC are my faith community. Finding friends and having the opportunity to serve through CFSC has allowed me to grow both into and out of myself in the most profound ways possible. It has truly allowed me and given me permission to let my light and my life shine in the world. And I am deeply, deeply grateful for um, both those opportunities and all of you who have borne witness to that and supported it and encouraged it and shed your light on it as well. So thank you for that. Thank you, Lana. Thank you for the light that you shine for all of our community um, of friends. And thank you for sharing that light through your stories tonight and through your service. I now um, invite friends to, we're gonna open up discussion. Um, so if you have any questions, you can feel free to raise your hand um, using the raise hand function at the bottom um, or wave frantically at me and I'll try to see you. Or if you uh, would prefer to put your question in the chat, I will try to keep my eye on that as well. So to start us off, I see Ruth. Go ahead, Ruth. Thank you. Hello, Lana. Hello, everybody. Um, when you were talking about your experience at the World Gathering of Friends in Kenya, you said uh, that you described how you had the opportunity, opportunity to experience what it is, a sense of what it is that unites Quakers <laughs> worldwide as one family. And I thought, oh, great. She's going to tell us what it is that unites us. <laughs> And I'm being a little facetious, but I'm I'm just wondering if that sounds like a really profound experience. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about what that was like for you and if you can put any words to what that was. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Ruth. It's lovely to see you. It's really lovely to see you. Um, it, it was a really profound experience. And that question was what was in my mind when I made the application for the grant and decided that this was something I wanted to do because you talk to people about, you know, your, your Quaker community and, oh, so what do Quakers believe? Well, I can tell you what I believe and I can, you know, make one statement that might be true for most friends, um, but there is this spectrum and you explain the spectrum, people say, well, you can't possibly all be friends. So in Kenya, one of the things, um, that happened was um, uh, an epistle. So they posted all these epistles from uh, different groups up on the outside wall of the gathering place. And one of the epistles came from the friends of the LGBTQ plus community. And, and so they as a group had written this epistle and it was put up on the wall. Well, uh, Kenya is a different kind of Quaker world, and somebody had taken and ripped down that epistle off the wall. And this was seen um, by many people there as uh, an act of violence. It was unexpected. It was challenging. It was hurtful. It was painful. Um, but it was there. And so um, it had to be dealt with. And it, it had to be explored. And, and it, it showed 
that diversity of community for one thing, but what happened afterward was the most important piece that we all went into these um, home rooms in the morning to begin our day where friends from all different backgrounds and places would come together in, in smaller groups like 20 or 30 of us in a room. And we sat with this, we talked about it and we sat with it. And then we would gather in the larger group and sit with it. And it was not comfortable in many ways. It was not comfortable at all. And some of those conversations were hard and painful, but we sat with it. And what occurred to me in that moment was what united us was a deep desire to sit with one another, even in our discomfort. We may never come to agreement. We may never even come to understanding but we could come to a place where we could continue to sit together in that discomfort. And for me, that, that took a lot, but people were willing to do it. It wasn't easy. Um, and I, 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 don't, I don't know that I have any other words to describe how deeply comforting it was to be in that large community with people who were willing to sit in their discomfort together, knowing that we may not come to anything more than that sitting. Um, no, it wasn't a peace testimony. Uh, it was a, yeah, it was the epistle from the LGBTQ. And in Kenya, that's very frowned upon. That's not a cool thing. Gay is not okay to a lot of the very conservative friends in Africa in particular. Um, so yeah, that was, that was, my, that was my big takeaway. Uh, Ruth, thanks for asking about that. And I think about it to this day when people ask, what, what, do, you, you know, what do you see as uniting you all? And I, I can't even say that you know, we would never say that we would agree with war because I know there are friends who think that there is such a thing as a just war. Um, so I can't say that. But I can say that I witnessed people sitting together in their discomfort, knowing they may not come to agreement or understanding, but they were willing to sit there instead of um, dividing. And I think that's important. That's a beautiful example. Thanks, Lynn. And thanks for the great question, Ruth. I see uh, Pete Cross with his hand up. Hi, Pete. <laughs> Hi. Um... That was uh, such a wonderful presentation, and uh, I, I'm sure everybody enjoyed it as much as I did, Lana. Um, in recent years, I've been asked a couple of times, what led you to service? And my answer isn't, I wasn't led to service. I was always service. I can remember at seven years old wanting to help uh, an Eastern European kid who was in our neighborhood and being picked on. And Although my family were a good family, they weren't particularly service oriented. It was just me. And Lana, although I think you've had some pushes and nudges by your family along the way, I think service is you as well. Thanks, Pete. You're gonna make me cry, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there've always been things that I just felt like, yeah, I, I, that is just it. It is, it's inside, it's, it's in there. That's lovely, yeah. Um, a message that all of us can do with hearing again. Um, we do have a question in the chat and then I also see a question from Carol Dixon. Um, so the question in the chat comes from Elizabeth Block, and she's wondering, um, what is depicted in the stained glass window? Uh, were they birds? Were they all birds? Maybe you could tell us the story of that beautiful window that you helped to create. Oh, yeah, totally. And um, then we'll go to Carol. Can you put that picture up again, Rachel? Is that possible? Or Kira? Uh, okay, so 
Um, I build uh, stained glass windows. That's that's a thing I do. That's my hobby. It's my one artistic endeavor. And my mom lives in Prince Rupert and so has a number of connections. And one of those people attends uh, regularly the Anglican Church. And they had received um, a gift of some funds to build. They wanted, they have this big uh, tower in as part of the church building. And it is the cathedral. And that was actually a learning for me as well. Um, what makes it a cathedral? And it's all about a chair, an actual chair. I had no idea. Anyways, so they commissioned these windows um, and they were reconciliation windows. So these are Haida um, totems representing different families, different um, uh, family groups uh, yeah. in their, their social structure. And so the one, the, yep, there's a killer wheel and an eagle and a bear and a thunderbird. Um, and the woman that designed them uh, was from Haida Gwaii. I can't recall her name now. Um, and it took me, so I constructed the, the, the totems themselves uh, in my studio in Shawnigan. And then I packaged up those along with all the glass and my tools and drove them up to Prince Rupert where I set up a little uh, studio space in my mom's carport and finished the construction um, and delivered the windows to the cathedral. And they weren't able to install them for about three years. They had the windows sitting in the church and they had to raise more funds to get uh, somebody to install them because that's not my, I don't really know how to do that part of it. But you know, it was a, it was a real honor. And I think about it as a stained glass artist, quite aside from anything else, as a stained glass artist, it is sort of the epitome of being able to employ your craft in the building of uh, cathedral windows, because that's where stained glass artistry sort of originated and found its purpose, you know, to let the light of God in in this beautiful, incredible way. Um, so. Yeah, I, I felt like it was a real, it was a real gift to be able to do them. It was hard work, mind you, but um, it was awesome. Oh, really beautiful. Thanks for sharing the explanation with us, Lana. And uh, Carol Dixon. Carol. Well, Lana, that, that was very wonderful. Uh, I, I don't know how many people know these many diverse gifts that you bring to friends. I had forgotten about the glass, but one of the um, parts of the work that you've done over the years with CFSC is around personnel and the remarkable challenges that you and personnel committee had to deal with. What, what did you learn about how, about being in your role? What did you learn about being the person who helps facilitate the complications of personnel <clears throat> within service committee? Wow, Carol. Too difficult. No, thank you for that question. I, I had the most incredible experience um, in my role as personnel clerk. Uh, we did have some um, difficult things that uh, we, we did work through. And I can honestly say that During that time, I, I, this is gonna sound so strange, but it's not the only time, but it is, it is one of the most moving moments. I, I took my concern and my challenge to the light. And I honestly, I didn't know what to do. 
I now I am going to cry. There we go, Pete. You can be happy now. Sorry. <laughs> I, I took that concern and the challenge to the light. And I didn't know personally in myself, in my brain, I did not know what to do. I did not know how to navigate the course that was in front of me uh, and, and the rest of us on personnel committee because we're never alone. Um, and I took it one night, I remember very clearly, I took it outside to my little happy place because I was sleeping outside at the time. And I sat on my back porch at night and I just asked for help. And, and it was, it was, it, it was, I, I don't even have the words. It was the most amazing thing. I shouldn't be amazed by it, but I am. It just, the, the, the way open, it just became clear, so clear. There was no doubt in my mind when it landed that this was the way opening for me and for the committee and for everyone involved to, to tenderly and gracefully and compassionately and practically attend to the challenge that was in front of us. I, I know I have asked for help on many occasions and sometimes I, I don't know if the answer is muddled or if it's just me that's muddled. But that one time, Carol, thank you for, I, I've forgotten all about that moment. It was so incredibly clear. I, I don't have another explanation for that. Th thank you. I, I know it was a very personal, difficult time for you and so many on service committee. And what a lot of hurdles service committee has to get through from year to year. And that was just one. I was glad you were there to do such a good job. Thanks, Carol. Thanks friends for this rich discussion. There's also um, that we still have some more time if there's more questions and if Lana's not too tired out. <laughs> um, but I am seeing some lovely comments in the, in the chat about the different connections friends have made worldwide uh, through, through different service work. And oh, I see Monica has a question. Hi, Monica, go ahead. Right, I have to, I, I, I'm, my, my connection is not really secure. Uh, Lana, thank you so much for your talk. Yeah, and as we're talking about crying, um, I, I didn't know Lana very well and I wasn't sure what stage it is, Lana, but I remember our drive to uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not a crier, but uh, so, so I, I when Lana first cried, I thought, what, what, what is she doing? <laughs> and so by the time we started the journey to the end, I, I not only learned that, the, at least I didn't not only felt that the crying was certainly an integral part of Lana. I don't think she can, you can do it life without that, right, Lana? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that struck me about you, Lana, on that journey, was that you were able to kind of pin yourself in to the sentiments and the, the feelings and the behavior and all of that of so many different people. Um, that at, at the time I thought, come on folks, like you're a bunch of Quakers, get it together. <laughs> and was my thought, but somehow you were way, you, you taught me that there is I don't know if I can ever really do it, but you taught me what it looks like when you can absorb folks that are misbehaving as far as I was concerned, or folks that were doing all kinds of things, but you can in, pull them in, do your shifting, do your crying, doing all of that. And at the <laughs> end of the day, we are in a good place. And it, it, you reminded me of, um, you know, some of the kind of biblical 
folks that were in rough times and then ended up having kind of brought people together. And so that's a really wonderful asset that I think that you have lived with CFSC and brought to CFSC and shared to CFSC. And I gotta tell you, I, I mean, I love you dearly. I still can't understand the crying piece. So whenever <laughs> it happens, I call Jennifer and I say, she's crying again. And so <laughs> everybody takes care of that. But I think that you're a remarkable person with an amazing amounts of gifts. And, and you epitomize when you make a decision to work with CFSC, all the things you have to do and, and, and they're not all wonderful, but at the end of the day, you help us to remember that we can stand steady and wait on the light and wait no matter how uncomfortable and wait and being steady. So thank you so much for your service. It's amazing. And I think you've done a terrific job and, and CFSC is, is certainly fortunate to have met you or you have met it, by the way. Um, thank you. Oh, you're so kind, Monica. I remember that trip now. I think PJ remembers it too. I do. <laughs> Lots of fun with friends over the years. Oh, yes. Um, we have a great question from Rob Hughes in the chat here. Um, Rob, do you want to read this out? Sure. Well, I let's see if I can pull up the chat again. OK, so um, uh, Lana, I know that you have a significant life event coming up. So how is this uh, affecting your service work or how will it affect your service work? Well, I'm pretty sure when my check from CPP comes, it won't have that big of a deal. On this <laughs> no, no, I wasn't referring to that. As you well <laughs> Don't be cheeky. <laughs> uh, thanks. Thanks, Rob. Um, yes, I do have a significant event coming up. My um, lovely girlfriend and I planned to be married. Uh, Hopefully the meeting will give their blessing so that we can be married under the care of the College and Valley monthly meeting um, this coming March. And um, I, my, it, it hasn't affected my service work in, other than to have someone here to support that work, to be there, you know, when I'm fussing over an email that I forgot to send Virginia in the middle of the night. And, you know, she's there to say, if you need to get up and do that email now, go ahead. And I think to myself, that's so lovely. I'm sure Virginia will be patient enough and wait for me until tomorrow. That was last night, Virginia. Um, she's Michelle. Michelle's a lovely, amazing, tender, thoughtful, kind, human being and I am so blessed to have her in my life. And the thing, the thing is I've, I, I've been married before um, and I've had relationships, but for the first time, I truly understand what friends believe about marriage being the work of spirit, that spirit marries us and that I'm already married. I'm as married as I'm ever gonna be, ever. Um, I look forward to the opportunity, uh, all things being equal, to celebrate that, um, shout it from the rooftops, if you will, uh, with friends and family next year. Um, but in my, my heart, I, I am so wedded to this incredible human being. And I know that service committee members are probably tired of hearing me wax on poetic about Michelle. I say the same glowing things every time, but they're just all true. So what are you gonna do with that? Thank you. That's fabulous. And I think I can say on for sure for from all of us and all the glowing smiles, I can see we're all so happy to hear that. Did I see, um, Carolyn, did I see your hand raised? Okay, go ahead. I just want to go back to the conversation about tears. Um, 
and it's a little bit of telling a story on my own stance as a Quaker, but as a child, there was a meeting, a, a, a member of my family meeting, which was part of Philadelphia yearly meeting, um, whose name was Betsy somebody. And she was a very gifted minister when she spoke once in a blue moon. And she would shake, you know, in that Quaker sense of quaking when she spoke and she would have tears. And I, I was impressionable enough. I was probably somewhere in the eight to 12 range that it just struck me, well, that's the spirit moving through us. And it's always stayed with me. And I am somebody who, you know, if, I, if I'm not sure about whether the ministry or the message I have is really ministry, the measure of it is when I sit down, am I quaking, am I shaking? And, and I often, and I'm in tears, and then I trust it. And I, I, I love knowing that about you, Lana, and thank you for telling us that. And <laughs> since I'm speaking, I'll just say one more thing, which is that some years ago now, I really don't know, at least, a, at least more than a decade, um, Michael Wida, who worked for FGC at that time as some kind of outreach fundraising person, said that in his experience, the thing that unites all the spectrum of Quakers, that everybody has business meeting, the sense of being able to come to a sense of the meeting, which is bigger than consensus, that that's a sacred process. And that all varieties of Quakers do that, that they make their decision. And I love the way you describe the sitting with our discomfort, that's great. But just adding that other piece that I think Michael had been to some kind of world gathering and that's what he shared, which has also stayed with me. So thank you, Lana, for all the stories you're telling. Thanks, Caroline. And uh, thank you. I, I know that it's so lovely to see you every week um, or most weeks at Meeting for Worship on Wednesday mornings. Um, and uh, the gift of your poetry. Uh, I will be, um, you know, with your permission, you know, sharing some of those bits with friends for Christmas in an advent calendar because they're beautiful. Thank, Thank you. For sharing them with us. Thank you. Susan McMaster in Ottawa Meeting is actually editing a collection of Yay. poems. So more friends will hear about it in due course. I'm so excited to hear that. That's wonderful. And I think we have time for just one more question. And I think a fabulous person can lead us into that final question. So I'm going to pass it to Virginia Dawson. Um, and then we'll wrap up from there with a few announcements. And of course, Lana, if you wanted to give any closing words after you hear what Virginia has to say or ask, please go ahead. Well, I, I just, I'll try and be quick. I just, I want to pay tribute to, to um, all that Lana did in, in personnel. I, I, her, her integrity is just stellar and, but the other thing I love about her is her sense of humor. I, every time we would, we would meet, we would have serious things to talk about, but we always managed to laugh and that helped to make it, make it easier. It, it was also lovely to hear about the Friends um, World Conference in, um, in Kenya. Um, any connection I've had with FWCC has, has always been, um, very inspiring and it was interesting because as you were talking about it it reminded me that also at that 2012 in uh, Kenya the Kabarak call for peace and eco justice was approved and here we are in 2021 with COP26 and not a lot has changed so I think we we would all be um, mindful to look at the Kabarak call again because um, it it really excuse me, does speak from friends all around the world about, about the, the, you know, what we face for the planet. Anyway, thank you. It was lovely to hear this story of your life that lots of it I, I didn't know at all. So thank you. Oh, well, thanks, Virginia. Lovely way for us to end with that reminder of threads pulling us together from the Cabaret call until today with, with COP going on over in Europe. Um, 
So Lana, did you have anything you wanted to say before we sort of started to close up? Um, there, are, there are so many things I could say and so few words that would do it adequately. It's just such a privilege uh, to see all of you and to be in community with all of you, um, near and far. And uh, friends I haven't seen for a long time. Hi, Rick and Sarah. Oh my goodness. What a treat to see you. Um, just, I, I, I am just so incredibly grateful for the light that you all bring to the world and that you share in however many ways with however many others. I'm just grateful to um, catch a glimpse of you shining away out there. And um, I'm grateful just knowing that you're out there. And thank you, Rachel, uh, for being my introductory person and for being that person all those years ago, looking after my young son, who's not so young anymore, which makes you not so young anymore, I hate to remind you. Um, and Kira, for all the technical work that you do to make these events amazing, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of CFSC at this time, 90 years strong. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you so much, Lana. And before we all take off, 90 years strong is indeed where we are. And um, we know that the CFSC's service work and uh, you know, all of the good kinds of work that Lana was describing and making reference to, it's really only possible through the generous support of donors uh, like all of us. Um, and many of you I know are already donors, but I'm going to preach to the choir and say that we do have a goal this year for our 90th anniversary of raising $90,000 for 90 years of service. So Kira is going to put a, a link in the chat um, if you would like to make a generous contribution, feel free. Also feel free to share this um, beyond friends, beyond our circles here. This work impacts many people beyond Quakers. Um, so do feel free to share the good works of CFSC outside of our community. Um, and we have an upcoming, uh, well, a month from now on November 25th. We are going to do this again, and so I hope to see you all again uh, for a discussion with Tony McQuail and Roger Davies, and that promises to be a really interesting evening. And um, finally, if you have any ideas on how we can make these evenings better, um, how to improve for the next time, feel free to email Kira, and she's going to put her email in the chat as well. Um, so if you have any suggestions or any ideas at all, or just your glowing positive feedback is also welcome, um, do feel free to reach out to Kira. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Kira, who has one announcement to finish us off. And again, I just want to thank all of you for showing up and for sharing your good energy through your smiles and good looks through the cameras. It's really fabulous to see you all in support of our good friend, Lana. So thanks again, Lana, and over to you, Kira. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I just wanted to say, Lana, thank you so much for your sharing. You're always so open and honest and compassionate. Um, and I'm so thankful that I get the chance to work with you on a regular basis through CFSC. Um, and I'm really looking forward to next month's Get to Know the Friend with Tony McQuail and Roger Davies. Um, and I just wanted to let folks know that we actually do have one other event next month. It's called Tales of Peaceful Protest. And actually, uh, Ruth Walmsley, who's here with us tonight, is going to be one of the speakers. And it's um, some stories and expert advice and strategies um, on engaging in nonviolent direct action. And we have, so Ruth will be one of our speakers. And we'll also have um, a nonviolent strategist named Rivera Sun. Um, and she's also an author will also be joining us as well as um, someone from the uh, World Beyond War and No Fighter Jet campaign. So that's on November 18th. It's also a Thursday. Um, I'll put the link in the chat uh, for more information about that, but I'm hoping that friends can also join us for that event. Um, but anyways, thank you so much for coming tonight and for joining us. Um, and I hope everyone has a great night. <laughs>